The Holy Gospel according to St. Mark, the 15th chapter. Glory to you, O Lord. Now, at the feast, Pilate used to release for them one prisoner for whom they asked. And among the rebels in prison who had committed murder in the insurrection, there was a man called Barabbas. And the crowd came up and began to ask Pilate to do as he usually did for them. And he answered them saying, do you want me to release for you the king of the Jews? For he perceived that it was out of envy that the chief priests had delivered him up. But the chief priests stirred up the crowd to have him release for them Barabbas instead. And Pilate again said to them, then what shall I do with the man you call the king of the Jews? And they cried out again, crucify him. And Pilate said to them, why? What evil has he done? But they shouted all the more, crucify him. So Pilate, wishing to satisfy the crowd, released for them Barabbas. And having scourged Jesus, he delivered him to be crucified. And the soldiers led him away inside the palace, that is the governor's headquarters. And they called together the whole battalion. And they clothed him in a purple cloak and twisted a crown of thorns. They put it on him. And they began to salute him, Hail, King of the Jews! And they were striking his head with a reed and spitting on him and kneeling down in homage to him. And when they had mocked him, they stripped him of the purple cloak and put on his own clothes. And they led him out to crucify him. This is the Gospel of the Lord. Praise you, O Christ. Together let us confess our faith through the words of the Apostles' Creed. Oh 
This love of Christ shall flow like rivers. Come wash your guilt away. Grace, mercy, and peace be to you from God our Father and our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. Our meditation today comes from the Gospel reading, especially the first part, verses 6 through 15. Release for us, Barabbas. We celebrate Palm Sunday. That's kind of the moniker we've gone by for quite a while for this Sunday. And with good reason, we started off by remembering how the crowd welcomed Jesus that Sunday 2,000 years ago. As John tells us, they took branches from palm trees, they went out crying, Hosanna! Hosanna is from a Hebrew word that means, save us. In the setting where this was drawn from, the Old Testament, it was a plea, a cry, a prayer to God. But here, it's more of an exaltation. Save us, O God. They're crying this because they see here is the answer to this prayer. Jesus riding in on a donkey, he's the one. The one promised who would come and save us. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, even the King of Israel. Messianic, the promised descendant of David who would rule on a throne, here he comes. It's all coming to fruition. We've waited so long and now is the time. He's coming to be our king, which to most of those people meant Rome is going to be thrown out and he's going to rule. And we will return to the glory we had during the kingdom of David. <laughs> I can't say the hallelujah word, but Hosanna! Joyous, joyous celebration. Most of the people in Jerusalem, this is their mindset. As we see from a comment in John's Gospel at the end, the Pharisees saying to one another, you see that you are gaining nothing. Look, the whole world has gone after him. And if this is where our focus stopped, we could rightly call this Palm Sunday. But it doesn't. A better 
thing to call this holiday is Passion Sunday. Because we start with this joyous celebration, but we follow and see what happens and where it goes. Because by the time we get to our gospel reading, they're no longer shouting. They're no longer saying, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. We find Jesus rejected by that entire crowd, mocked, and led out to be crucified. Our meditation this morning is going to take into account that wondrous beginning and this awful ending and see how it came about. And even more so where we fit into this passion drama because we have a place here too. So, so far, and we've covered this through our Wednesday night Lenten services, we have the prayer of anguish in the garden by Jesus. Where the weight of what he will suffer and the sins of all the people of the world begin to fall on him and crush him and he cries out in an anguished prayer, Father, if there was any other way, but your will be done, not mine. If this is what must be done, I will do it. Jesus encourages the disciples to pray, but they instead sleep. Then there's a betrayal in the arrest, where Judas, one of his 12, leads a group of Roman soldiers, temple guards, and other people with swords and clubs and torches to Jesus to arrest him. We have Peter pulling a sword in a futile attempt to defend him, and Jesus says some powerful words. Peter, put that sword away. Now is the hour of darkness. The powers of darkness will have their way. But Jesus is not being overpowered by these powers of darkness or the prince of darkness, which is Satan. We see this when the soldiers first show up. Jesus says, who are you looking for? Jesus of Nazareth, he steps forward and says, I am he. I am. In Hebrew, Yahweh, the divine name which the Lord has been worshipped by his people of old. And at that, because Jesus' words have power behind them, these trained Roman soldiers, the temple guards, and all the people step back and fall backwards. Because whether they will confess it or not, they are standing before the Lord God, the creator of all things. After that happens, he allows the powers of darkness to have their way. He is arrested and he's marched off to Caiaphas. He appears before Caiaphas in the ruling council. It lasts a good part of the night. They try to find witnesses. They can't find anybody that would agree because all of the things they're saying really never happened. He didn't say those things. He didn't do those things. Finally, Caiaphas puts him under oath as the high priest. Are you the Christ, the Son of the Blessed? And Jesus answers, I am. And you will see the Son of Man seated at the right hand of power and coming with the clouds of heaven. This is what Caiaphas wants. Jesus admits to being the Messiah, the promised king in the line of David. They can go tell Rome now, this guy thinks he's a king. And Rome will convict him. But even more so among the Jews, Jesus here, using Old Testament analogy from Daniel, has claimed to be equal with God. And that's blasphemy. And any Jews that had a doubt at that time would admit he needs to die. And so in the morning, when the Roman court opens and Pilate is ready, they take Jesus to Pilate, who takes him from them and takes his case. Takes him in and questions him. Are you a king? Jesus says, you say that I'm a king. And there's a little bit of back and forth here because it depends on what you mean by king. The Jews mean that he's the Messiah, the promised king who's going to sit on a throne in Jerusalem. 
That's not the kind of king Jesus came to be. When he clears that idea off a of Pilate's plate, he finally responds, yes, indeed, I'm a king, but I have a kingdom that is not of this world yet. Because Jesus is a king. He's the creator God. It is through him God said, let there be, and it was. Every single thing, including the first two human beings and the life that they received, came from him. And even after that, as his creation fell, he's the one that kept the world spinning. He's the one that kept the seasons coming. He's the reason why, even now today, we have not destroyed each other. He keeps the world spinning. He keeps everything going. He truly is more than the king of the Jews, the king of the universe. But he points some things out to Pilate. My kingdom is not what you think it is. And really, if he sat down and talked to Pilate, he would say, you rule because I allow you to. I want you here as governor at this time for my purpose and for the Father's purpose. But that's a little more than Pilate can understand right now. So he does tell him something important. If I was really a king like you think I was, I would have had guards. I would have had soldiers that would fight to prevent me from being arrested. Pilate says, yeah, that's true. Although Pilate doesn't understand what this kingdom that's not as this world means, he does understand one thing. This man is no threat. This man is no insurrectionist. This man is not guilty of any Roman law and should be set free. Enter our gospel reading. We're told that at this time of year, Pilate had a normal, regular tradition that he did. He would release to them one prisoner whom they asked for. Which actually, I mean, Pilate's no joker. Pilate knows a thing or two about governing people, especially the Jews. He's been there a while. He may not completely understand what this Passover festival is about, although if he did, it would help. The Jews gathered to celebrate their freedom from captivity in Egypt. They celebrated the fact that God came and with a mighty hand saved them from this mighty empire and made them a free people. Pilate does know this. At this time of year, there's trouble. People rise up, insurrectionists rise up, and want to take control. It appears it's already happened. He has several men already bound and in jail who had tried an insurrection and actually killed some people. So this is kind of an olive branch that he gives to the people at that time. You celebrate freedom. I will release to you one man, even though I found him guilty, I'll release to you one man of your choosing. And here is Barabbas. He's found guilty murdered somebody. We don't know if it was a Jew or if it was a Roman. Probably since he's in jail and destined to die, probably at least a Roman. The crowd came up. They're expecting this. This is what normally happens. Pilate, when are you going to release to us that prisoner? He said, okay. How about this? How about we release for you the king of the Jews? Pilate knows Jesus is innocent. Pilate is trying the best he can to get this man released. Now he knows the chief priests are looking for him to die. But perhaps he has heard about the welcome that Jesus received on Palm Sunday. The people were extraordinarily behind him. They loved him. Surely if he presents it to the people, they will say, yes, release for us Jesus of Nazareth. He knows something else, too. He knows the reason why the chief priests want Jesus killed. Out of envy. Out of jealousy. You think of what Jesus has been doing during that week in the temple in Jerusalem. He's been teaching, but he's been challenging the authority of the priests, the Sadducees, and the scribes. He's been showing to the people that they are wrong. And the people love it. They love to see Jesus stick a dig into these guys. 
And it puts them behind him even more. And the priests and the scribes and the Pharisees are just sitting there and stewing. They want to see this guy dead. Who is he? Who is he to stand in our place? Who is he to take the power and authority that is ours? They can't do anything because the crowd's all against him. But now, now they can do something. And that jealousy and that envy that's been brewing in their heart. Hey, everybody, you know who Pilate should release? Barabbas. Tell Pilate to release Barabbas. The chief priest stirring up the crowd. Must have been good at crowd control. But I don't think it's only what Pilate was doing that changed the tone of everyone. Throughout that week, while they're listening to Jesus preach in the temple, they've been waiting for him. Waiting for him to step up and challenge Rome and be that king. Take that throne. Assume that rule with his mighty supernatural power that they've seen he has. But he hasn't done that. And now, standing there next to Pilate, is a bruised and beaten man, chained. One that doesn't seem able, willing, or have the power to defeat Rome. They've seen others like Jesus come before. Claim to be the Messiah, claim to be able to lead an insurrection against Rome, and they failed, and people died. And you know what? They're done with them. Release Barabbas? Sure. Sounds like a great thing. Pilate's still trying. He doesn't understand this. He's still trying to get Jesus released. Then what shall I do with a man you call the king of the Jews? Crucify him! They say it over and over and over again. Why? What evil has he done? He hasn't. He hasn't done a single thing that would deserve his death. The power of darkness wants his death, but you know something? Jesus is still in control. Even though the powers of darkness, the chief priests and now the people, all from their heart desire to see him die, it fits right into the will of the Father and the plan of Jesus. Because this is why he came. So, Pilate gets to the point where he's done. In the Gospel of Matthew, it tells us he washes his hands. It's all upon you. He releases for them Barabbas, who goes free. And instead, a guilty man heads to be crucified. Where's the justice? Where's the love? Where do we fit into this drama? Well, there's the people who turned against Jesus. We love Jesus. People outside the church love Jesus. They love Jesus as a savior. Forgive my sins, Jesus, but when you start to tell me what I should and shouldn't do, well, I don't know about that. Yeah, some of those sins, I'm right on about that. We shouldn't murder, you got it. We shouldn't steal, you shouldn't got it. We shouldn't cheat on our wife, you betcha, that's wrong. But gossip? Oh, come on now. Jesus, who doesn't do that once in a while? And you say that hatred in my heart is equal to murder? Oh, come on! Who doesn't get mad at somebody sometimes? Who doesn't have jealousy and envy at somebody sometimes? In this culture, who doesn't say one thing and everybody just piles on as it's wrong? You can't be telling me to do that, can you, Jesus? How can I obey that? Be the Savior that continues to forgive my sins, but don't lay on me these requirements. The crowd loved Jesus when he would be the kind of Savior they wanted him to be. And in our culture, and even in my heart, it's the same way. 
those things he tells me to do that I find unreasonable or stand against what my heart believes, well, you not my king then. Just forgive those things, Jesus, but don't expect me to keep, to keep doing them. Then there's the chief priests with a jealous rage. Well, we never have that against each other, do we? People never make us angry enough that we, in our thoughts, we want to see the wrath of God fall on them. Maybe we don't reject, we don't uh, put that on Jesus, but we sure put that on one another at times. In our lives, we've had that same kind of jealousy and rage that the priest did. Then there's Barabbas. Barabbas the convicted killer. Barabbas who deserved death goes free. We're Barabbas. We're the insurrectionists. We're the one, every time we sin, we commit insurrection against the Lord God, the Creator God. Wages of sin is death. And we're the rebels that deserve death. But thank God, like Barabbas, we go free. Because Jesus took our place. The suffering that we deserve in this life and in eternal life, he took upon himself. Pilate turns him over with a whip that either had metal shards or bones at the end, they whipped him until his back was raw to prepare him for crucifixion. They put a royal robe on him. They put a crown of thorns. They said, you're our king. Hail Jesus. He really is that king. He endured that for you and I. That's what we deserve. And he took it. And as he was doing that, he did not do it out of hate. He did it out of love. Love for you and love for me. He went to the cross out of love to take your death, not just punishment in this world, but the eternal punishment that we deserve. He suffered that eternal punishment upon the cross for you out of love so that you would never have to. And thought of you on the cross with love so that you would not die and be separated eternally, but be with him forever. He's the God that created mankind knowing it would fall, but did so not because he had to, but out of love. The one who planned from the very beginning to actually come and set things right by becoming himself part of creation and to suffer that punishment that we justly deserve, the punishment that all of our sins have earned for us, to suffer that in our place out of love. When I think of Jesus hanging on the cross and in all that enduring agony, struggling to take a breath, and his back rubbing against that rough piece of wood. And all the while, he's not thinking of me with hate, but with love. I can't understand how that can be, but it is. The love that Jesus has is beyond manufacturing in my heart. But through the gospel, through the word and sacrament, it's his gift to me. By faith, I begin to experience that love for him and for you. Our sermon hymn calls it an amazing love. My Lord, what love is this that pays so dearly that I, the guilty one, may go free? And so they watched him die, despised, rejected. But oh, the blood he shed 
flowed for me, flowed for you. Amazing love. Oh, what sacrifice. The Son of God given for me. My debt he pays. My death he dies. That I and you might live. And now, this love of Christ shall flow like rivers. Come wash your guilt away and live again. That's how this love was given to you. That's how this faith was given to you in baptism. It washed over and into your life and it never left. And the Spirit, through the Word and through the sacrament, through this very Word I preach, is giving it again over and over and over to you, pouring it out in immense portions throughout our divine service so that you have that love and can hold that love and even more so hold the Savior who gives it by faith. Knowing that when this life is over, eternal life is to come. Amazing love, oh what sacrifice. The Son of God given for me. My debt he pays and my death he dies. That I might live. Live now. And live in eternal life to come. His sure and certain promise. Given through that gift of faith. Given to me along with that amazing love. Quite a contrast, isn't it? From the welcome of Jesus on Palm Sunday to by Good Friday, his death on the cross. Not an accident. All part of God's salvation plan. All of it done out of love for you and for me. This Holy Week as we travel through and look at Jesus' announcement of betrayal at the Last Supper and his gift of the Lord's Supper. See that as his gift of love to you. And as we read through the Good Friday Passion, in all of its horrible bleeding and suffering and death, know that that was done out of a gift of love for you. And then Easter Sunday, that love explodes into reality. The fruit of that gift of love, life with him now, and eternal life to come. As you proceed through this week, may that love and that faith engender in your heart and draw you closer to the one who loves you more than anything, your Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. <clears throat>